Please join me in welcoming this year's commencement speaker and proud father of Nick, Professor Gregory Mankey. Mr. Conrad, members of the faculty, trustees, parents, family, friends, and students of the class of 2013, congratulations to all of you. Congratulations to the faculty and trustees for creating and sustaining the fine educational institution where boys and girls are nurtured into young men and women. Congratulations to the parents, family, and friends for supporting these students through the often tumultuous years of being a teenager. And most of all, congratulations to the students who are graduating here today. This is truly a milestone for you. You've worked long and hard to be here, and you should feel justly proud of your accomplishment. But make sure that your pride comes with the requisite degree of appreciation. Before the day is over, be sure to give a hug to your favorite teachers. When you learn from them how to enjoy Shakespeare, how to factor a quadratic equation, or how, to, how the Federalist Papers shaped American democracy, you and your teachers are engaged in a joint activity. Your success is also their success. Be sure to appreciate as well the support your family has given you over the years. As an economist, I have to point out that this support is not only emotional, <laughs> although some of it is, but also financial. <laughs> Excellent schools like Chapel Hill, Chauncey Hall don't come cheap. You students are all fortunate for the chance to attend here, and for that opportunity, you should be sure to thank your benefactors. I'll always remember when my sister graduated from college. After the ceremony was over, she walked up to my parents in her cap and gown, handed, her, handed them her newly awarded diploma, and said, here's your receipt. <laughs> I'm often struck by the fact that graduation ceremonies are called commencements. As you know, the word commencement comes from the word commence, which means begin. Commencements are not so much the end of one experience as the beginning of another. To be sure, we're here to celebrate your completion from high school, but even more so, we are here to send you off into the world. So you can find your place in it and pursue your passions. In the years to come, you'll have more autonomy. You won't have teachers and parents looking over your shoulder. You won't have weekly progress reports on podium. <laughs> You'll have the power to make more of your own decisions. Most likely, you may find that prospect at the same time both thrilling and frightening. When you're at college making your own decisions, you can pull out your laptop and play Grand Theft Auto 24 hours a day. <laughs> but making more of your own decisions also means accepting more of the blame for your mistakes. Always remember the lesson of Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> it's an honor to be able to speak with you today. When Mr. Conrad invited me, he suggested that maybe as a professional economist, I could talk with you about the future economy that you will soon be entering and in which you will spend your lives. It is true that as an economist, I know precisely what the future holds. <laughs> But union rules prevent me from sharing that knowledge <laughs> with the general public. So we economists usually just make stuff up. <laughs> and it often turns out to be wrong. So I won't burn you with those made up stories today. What I'd like to do instead is share with you a few real stories about my own journey through life. Trite as it may sound, life is just a long learning experience. I hope these stories will illustrate a bit of what I've learned and maybe help guide you along the way. My narrative begins in 1965. Lyndon Johnson is president. And everyone is listening to the Beach Boys and the Beatles. I am in the second grade. At the time, I attended school in Cranford, New Jersey, where I grew up. It was a typical suburban public school. A short walk from home, nice playground, good teachers, but the classes were much larger than anything you'd ever see here at Chapel Hill, Chauncey Hall. I am sure this school worked well for many of the kids there. 
but it did not work for me. I was relatively shy. I usually sat in the back of the classroom. My main goal was to make it through the day without getting noticed. Most of the time I succeeded. One day, the teacher called my mother and asked her to come in and meet with her. So my mother came to school after class. The teacher explained they had given the entire class some kind of standardized aptitude test. Mrs. Mankiw, the teacher said. Greg did well. We were very surprised. <laughs> Until then, the teacher had thought I just wasn't very bright. And given my lackluster performance in class, that was a reasonable inference for her to make. But it turned out not to be correct. It was then that my parents realized I was in the wrong place. They understood that the teachers there barely knew me, and that while I could survive there, I wouldn't thrive. Soon thereafter, they pulled me out and sent me to an independent school where I stayed through high school. The school they sent me to was a lot like this one. It had small classes and a tight-knit community. No student could ever hide in the back of the class, like I had until then. Every student was involved, not only in the academic life of the school, but also the extracurricular activities. Everyone had to participate. For me, this change in school worked wonders. I was not a great athlete, but I ended up captain of the fencing team. I was not one of the cool kids, but I was president of the chess club. <laughs> I was not a diligent enough student to be valedictorian, but I was a far better student, having been an active member of the school community. So here's my first lesson. Communities matter. Communities influence your behavior and shape who you will become. So choose your communities wisely. Was the right community for one person is not necessarily the right community for another. Find a place that will support you and push you to be a better person, as this school has. So far in life, your parents have often chosen the communities for you. But going forward, this is going to be more of your responsibility. Okay, fast forward to my own high school graduation. It's now 1976. Gerald Ford is president. Everybody's playing Bruce Springsteen's Break the Album, Born to Run, and Bob Dylan's Blood in the Traps, which you should know is Bob Dylan's best album. It's a very important <laughs> fact to know in life. At the time, I was a school math geek. I took all the hardest math classes, took more math classes on weekends at a nearby university. It's in the summer before my senior year, a summer activity focused on math and astrophysics. I won the school math prize. I thought I was pretty hot. Well, you get the idea. <laughs> when I went to college the next fall, I started off as a math major, thinking I'd end up a professional mathematician. I was doing what economists call pursuing your comparative advantage, which means do what you are good at compared with other people. I thought if I was so good at math compared with my high school classmates, it makes sense to turn that talent into a career. But then something happened. I met other students who were Really good in math. <laughs> I mean, really good. These are the kind of kids who not only took hard math classes and did well in them, but they spent their free time competing in the International Math Olympiad. They were in a completely different league than I was. I felt like I was the most valuable player in my little league team. All of a sudden, I was practicing with the Red Sox. Over time, I realized that I was pretty good in math, but far from a star. I was good enough to take college-level math classes and pursue a more quantitative career, but I was probably not cut out to become a professional mathematician. So here's my second lesson for you. You may think you're good at something. You may think you know what you should spend your life doing, but you may well be wrong. You will learn a lot about yourself during your first few years of adulthood. Be prepared to change your mind about your path in life and about your self-image. I know I certainly did. Now, I realize that this lesson is a bit of a downer, but don't worry, the story's going to get better. <laughs> During my first year in college, like most people, I made a lot of new friends. One of them was a young man named Richard Greenberg. Academically, Richard and I were about as different as two people can be. I was a math science guy, Richard was into the arts. In fact, it's hard to imagine we had anything in common other than having to be thrown to the same freshman dorm. But for some reason, we got along splendidly, and we always enjoyed each other's company. We became roommates for the rest of our college years. As I mentioned, Richard was very much into the arts, but he wasn't sure where his niche was. 
what his comparative advantage was. Could he be an actor, an opera singer, a novelist? He tried out a variety of paths when we were in college. When we graduated, he still had a little idea which way to head, but he kept experimenting. He started a PhD in English literature, thinking he might become an English professor. But after a year, he dropped out of the program. It wasn't quite right for him. Now, at the time, it looked like Richard was floundering. Indeed, he was. Sometimes, floundering is what you need to do as a young adult, as you try to figure out your place in the world. But before you lay yourself off too easy, I should point out that not all floundering is created equal. Richard's floundering was the best kind. It was never lazy or aimless or paralyzed by fear and indecision. Rather, it was energetic, purposeful, and passionate. For each activity he tried, he gave it his all. And each activity taught him something about the world and about himself. So how did it all end? Well, Richard did not become an actor or an opera singer or a novelist or an English professor. Instead, he eventually went on to become a playwright. He now has had more than 25 plays produced on or off Broadway. One of his plays, Take Me Out, tells the story of a gay baseball player and the media reaction to his coming out. In 2003, it won the Tony Award for Best Play. Meanwhile, as Richard has spent his college years trying to find his niche in the arts world, I was doing much the same in more quantitative fields. My epiphany came to me in a most unexpected way. During my freshman year in college, I started dating a young woman, who happened to be in the same dorm floor as Richard and I. She also happened to be taking a freshman course in introductory economics. Those coincidences changed my life. She used to come back from her economics class and tell me what she was learning. To my surprise, I found it fascinating. I entered college with a little idea of what economics was and a little intention to study it. But from what she told me, it seemed that what she was learning was far more interesting than anything I was learning in any of my classes. So the next semester, I started taking economics classes, and I really liked them. And it turned out I was pretty good at them. Eventually, I switched my major from math to economics. I went on to get my PhD and have been a professor of economics at Harvard for almost 30 years, as well as an economic advisor to presidents and presidential candidates. It has been a great career for me. And it all began with some offhand conversations I had during my freshman year of college. This brings me to my third lesson. Your niche in life, your comparative advantage, is out there waiting for you. You may, find, you may not find it immediately. It may present itself to you in an unexpected time and an unexpected place. But be, but be sure to be ready with an open mind. One last story. Fast forward four more years. It's now March 1981. Ronald Reagan has just moved into the White House. And talking heads are starting to make it big in the music world. <laughs> I'm in my first year of a PhD program in economics at MIT. It's spring break. And I'm heading home to visit my parents in New Jersey. I'm taking the red line to South Station, where I plan to board an Amtrak train heading south. I spot a girl toward the other end of the subway car. She's cute. <laughs> I guess she's about my age, maybe a bit younger. She's probably a student too, I think to myself. I wonder, how can I meet her? It turns out that we both exit the T at the same station. We both start walking in the same direction. We both get in line to buy our train tickets. I'm behind her. She doesn't notice me. But it's actually fortunate. If she did, she might think I was a stalker. <laughs> we both start walking to the train platform. It looks like we are taking the same train. What a stroke of luck. I walk up to her. Excuse me, I say. Is this the train to New York? She assures me it is. I don't remember what I said next. But I kept talking, and she was polite enough to keep responding. When the train pulled into the station, we boarded, and I sat next to her. We chatted for the next few hours. I'm not sure what this young girl thought of me at the time. As far as I know, she might have thought I was a creep. But for the past 30 years, she's called me her husband. <laughs> And we've had three wonderful children together, one of whom is graduating here today. 
So this is my final lesson to you. Random stuff happens. Life is not completely in your control. To be sure, some of the random stuff is bad, but some of the random stuff is awesome. Everyone in life is dealt a different hand. If you want to be happy and successful, don't complain about the hand you've been dealt. That takes too much energy, which only ends up being wasted. Do your best to play the hand that you've got. And rest assured that as you're doing so, something or someone awesome may be right around the corner. Thank you very much.